Hello, hello, this is Pixie doing another video. Um, so my thoughts today are basically... I was thinking about someone, uh, the phrase. It's about the etymology of things. So you've got like, you've got breakfast or break fast. And what is what is meant by fast. And we really associate fast with speed. So if someone's fasting, there's processes in their body that are speeding up. And the only way someone would know that is if they had some, in the past, medical knowledge. So it could be healing, it could be some other factors in there. We know that autophagy increases. These processes naturally occur in any way, but they occur quicker in a faster state. And then we also use a phrase, for that person's fast asleep. Now fast and sleep doesn't really make sense if you look at the way the words are sort of constructed. So they're fasting. So the reason they're the well out of it is because there's a process that their body's speeding up. And so they've entered a deeper sleep. And that's why they're fast asleep or harder to wake up. Otherwise it'd be slowing. They're slowing rather than they're fast. Or some other phrase would have been used. So the origin of that word fast would be interesting to look more deeper into it. Where it actually comes from the root of the root part of the word. It could have amalgamated from different cultures. Which happens, I mean, with the English language definitely. But there's also what retained within the language was more ancient uses of language as well because they, they would be the same in different cultures so they kept them like oh, yeah, the word means that like you got weird like like god god dog rod as well the i know with the um you come across i think from russia is it russia so the reference of rod and like and we think of rod as a divine sort of um conduit that's basically that so there's some words and also God the way God sounds it sounds strange but it's it's um, kind of encapsulates something an essence rather than we're, we're kind of maybe with where the Muslims are with um, Allah and it being like the light it's um, it's not a force you can really it's like the towel you can't really put your finger on it that's why when people say they're doing Allah Akbar and doing going off and Killing people in, in, for, in, for some reason, it's not it's not other they're killing. They're doing it for they're doing it for their own self. It's their own ego. That's what it is. They've um, they've become um, caught up in a shroud, and um, and it might also be in essence, you might say uh, Shatan, which they have as their um, Satan, or they're under the a dark influence because no being of light wants to just do um, go around chopping people's heads off because it makes no sense whatsoever. Um, a lot of the um, Sharia laws are the interpretations people got from the Quran and put it into a book of law. And I think that's why different Muslims practice different things in that sense. And that's why the ones with veils. So when someone makes a joke about burqas and things like that, that's only a set group of um, Muslims. It's a bit like if someone took the mickey out of Catholics. That's a form of... Um, a form of Christianity, Catholicism, but it's slightly seen something slightly different. Or Jehovah's Witnesses, they come under fire from from Western society as well, because they kind of free. It's I tell you what draws attention and makes them become targets for people to sort of say, "Hey, look at them." It's the, the secularism. They um, by not being involved with a culture and pulling away, it makes you alienate that culture, and so they they point that out. That's what they're doing. If they make kind of these jokes, this is why. You know, there used to be jokes about English and Irishmen and Scotchmen, but I guess there's no point nowadays because everything's mainstream and it's more connected. There's not that division. They're not like, that culture's over there and this is us. Or a deflection of our own weaknesses culturally. So there's much more to it. Um, so there's a lot to learn, really. Um, it's quite beautiful in one way, um, the culture, and also English. So I remember the phrase... Um, Santos, a chap called Santos, he called it Anglish, which is like angel, angel language. And in essence, there is true because of um, what's also been seen by different cultures is if you can sing, if you sing within a, in a language, because it has an effect emotionally on them, that's seen as perceived as it. And it's kind of a consciousness construct to it. It is considered magical. And the reason, other thing as well, it's not not just um, the language of the mind. It's it's utilising the heart 
and often the route from our Greek uh, Roman ancestry from for the UK is that we're very focused in the, the philosophy, the psychology, the mind, and it becomes an over obsession with the mind. But then we forget to feel things. How do you feel about that? You know, we just say, "What's your thoughts on that?" And they try to see the emotional stuff as some kind of like byproduct of of the mental stuff. When actually, it's the it can be the complete reverse. And then you get away from thinking about what's about your mind. What do I need to do? You know, people like to have their head and stuff when they're sort of stressed out. They just stop, centre themselves, and they realise the knowledge comes from a, a deeper part than the intuition, everything else that's more and more um, deeper inside. And I, I think it's only when you kind of start to activate um, chakras that you get a, a deeper understanding of um, of energy. There's no point saying, oh, this is cheap, because you can sense cheap, but you, to manifest it, and then everything else about it is much more complicated. A lot of it relates to, um, to the nervous system as well. Um, that's why I say with the certain yoga techniques I've been doing with, with the heartful meditation, it's opened me up to new avenues, and that's just quite important. Because um, you can feel sense energy there, and that's a kind of going to work at building that connection. It's every muscle, every think, every neuro, neuro function, it requires effort and work. Otherwise, it seems to cease to be active. It goes into a kind of dormant state, and that's why it's quite important to sort of um, pursue a line of development. Really, progression. It's more more to life than money. Um, so I think that's one thing to need to explore: where the fast might turn up, and you say where the origins are for it. It also hints on some other ancient more ancient knowledge and if heart if fasting can hack into other things at the moment I've turned my <sighs> fire some pants so I did OMAD for a while and then it started to sort of um, change the structure of that and now it's more like um, it's not too far off a 16 eh? it's probably a 5 hour window still so yeah it's very much different Yeah, the window's very much um, different than it was. And you've got to... See, the thing is, your body ad adapts, and then it improves as well. So I'm still having the improvements. I still have to listen to my body. If I don't feel like eating, I shouldn't eat at all, so you just don't. Or you make allowances that you do something else. Or if you need to have a refeed, keep it minimum if it's in the, in the evening. I've got the advantages of winter. Sometimes I've been sleeping cold. So I'd be sleeping on top of the bed, um, without any clothes on, to be honest. And um, the room's been cool, and I've done it for a while. And it may be that I woke up at, say, 5 in the morning and I put covers on. But my body has been burning calories and adapted. I haven't, while well, I'm not woken up shivering, my body's adapted to that colder environment. It should be burning more calories. And anything I am, if anything like does come in the evening, that's going into burning energy. <clears throat> I'm not necessarily um, losing weight, but I'm maintaining. I'm not trying to eat eat food to put on weight. And this is why we put on weight at night, see. We wrap up extra warm at night, when normally you wouldn't if she's outside. You wouldn't have the opportunity. And it's colder at night. So you wrap up warm, you eat in the evening. When your body's very warm, it doesn't need this extra energy. Energy is stored. So if there's anything excess, that's why it's doing that. <clears throat> That's why the relationship between the, um, the the night is different from the day. I mean, of course, of course, if you practice something long enough, it becomes a um, sort of a habitual pattern, like your own bio algorithm. So you might burn more fats in the evening because you're more active in the day, and you're probably more sugary sugary based or carbs come in earlier in the day, <clears throat> and at night you might eat something completely different. And um, if you're not eating much in, in the evening, you're probably going to switch over to um, but in your fats, that's ideally where you would be. But then when you get balanced, your fasting gets more balanced. You know, I'm not really getting insulin spikes. Sometimes I notice them. If you have a lot of sugar, you feel knackered, you feel tired, because you have this thing about your um, body becoming um, insulin resistant. And that has an impact. 
um, when you have sugars and things. It just becomes, for your body, it's like really hard work all of a sudden. It's like if you have a massive meal, you think, crikey, I feel tired. And then you go out for it. You know, you just need to a little sort of half an hour re, sort of reset. Um, so less of that's happened. I know it's also hormonal. And it's to do with how a thyroid, it sort of overloads the system. Um, and just notice how my body reacts to things. Like at the moment, my stomach's quite warm. And I probably ate a few hours ago. Maybe three, three hours ago, three or four hours ago. Um, based on the time, three hours. Yeah, I probably ate about um, about eleven o'clock. <laughs> now it's about what, three o'clock. So um, body body generates some of heat. I don't feel thirsty necessarily. I don't feel hungry. I'm likely I will drink tea anyway. The other thing as well is I don't have the the, the kind of the advantages I would if I was my a sort of more native version of myself um, because when it's dark. I don't just settle down for the night. I have to keep them working, and the problem with that is that my body gets sorts of slow down, it's like switching gears. It wants to go on a lower gear, and I can't, which is a bit annoying. But then again, I don't have something to sort of um, basically bolster that up. So I like having loads of caffeine and stuff, because then that just throws out your system. You get to night and you think, well, I can't sleep now, and then the next day you feel really tired. So you want to get it, you want to get it right, whatever you're doing. <coughs> but fluid intake. Also, whether you what type of food you eat, how f how f long it takes to get through your body. I mean, if you're having something that takes um, a long period of time to get through your body, then you're still going to be absorbing nutrients through as it's going through, and you may your body will level off as it's eating. It will say, right, well, this is, this is digesting. Your certain hormones will come into play depending on what you're eating, um, because it just takes that time to break that food down. And um, your body knows it's, you know, it's an intelligent organism. It knows what it's absorbing. And um, it could take so many hours. I mean, possibly sometimes I've eaten things and they've taken, I would say, up to about eight. They could take eight hours to get your system. But usually, something you've eaten lunchtime, by the next day, next morning, you probably, if you go to the toilet in the morning, then it's probably out of your system. And if you're eating a nomad style lifestyle or things you're more than more aware of your bowel movement. Um, and I find sometimes I eat food and then afterwards it triggers a, a bowel movement. And that's because your body's in a rest state. So when you've kicked it into a gear, you know, it's woken up a bit more. And so that usually happens. But yeah, there's yeah, so some of my thoughts on sort of um, fasting. I mean, I've probably got to move things in new directions because the body's adaptogenic and uh, it adapts to new circumstances. So you need to present it with new problems in order to get new resources. Um, I've had a injury in my back, I think I caused it due to some combination of um, wear and tear um, from work and activity, um, maybe some poor posture and um, possibly as well certain exercises might have been poor, might have overdone them just swinging um, kettlebells around but it's a bit of a hair of a dog if you use the kettlebell, so, so now it's a bit better I started using it I noticed the part of me was clicking as I was doing something I did it quite a lot lighter and I think it's just pulling in some some muscle it's like it was out of out of place basically but the um, the body in essence is a bit like an instrument it's um, it's calibrated it's a tension in areas of the body and if you don't get that balance right other sides of your body will suffer instead because the balance isn't quite there so um, that's an area of work to do um, I had some i tell you what on a more spiritual thing I had this dream and it had r these rocks and I got recently got this rock that's quite um, um, I think it's obsidian and it's um, polished up. I can remember getting this thing oh, like a black mirror, so I was going to look at that. I thought, you know, it'd be interesting to use that. But I had this dream, these rocks, and they like they were like um, they were like cockroaches. There's a little rock walking around. I noticed it was walking around on this ground, and I don't know where I was. It's some different place. This other one come across quick, and, and just swallowed it up. And I thought that's weird. And I thought these these things because I know they're rocks, 
but they were all they were living and it was just a very strange surreal dream but it also highlights the fact that we think we know what's out there in this universe but there may be things we have never encountered before um, and we shouldn't rule out that, that maybe at some point technology may have evolved to um, a sentient level so there may be some synthetic life forms out there that have been created by well see, we always um, pertain to this there's always the ancient sort of alien theory on, on other human origins that we could have been tinkered with, influenced and that could be from multiple sources that could be from viruses and things added to the environment it could be from direct genetic manipulation it could be all sorts of things it could have been hybridization um, it could be that we was completely tailored from the start there's some stuff about the um, X gene in the human genome that's sort of um, fused and it's not natural to have that combination in nature but then again when if a, a proper ge geneticist looks at something he will follow the, nar he'll follow the narrative to keep make sure he gets paid but he knows there's a lot of things that don't make sense like um, I know they said about octopus DNA doesn't even doesn't match anything on earth so it's, it doesn't make any sense you know I mean there's cuttlefish and there's other things but the actual genes in there there's loads of them that just don't they're not not match up to anything so they talk about the likeness of genes looking like so they're looking for, at them and saying well that's the same gene but it's like a language so it doesn't really you know it's it, it might be similar but it just shows that the artist is using the same tools it doesn't mean that something's the same you know it's a bit like if I color match something I said if that's brown and that's brown it must be related it doesn't or well, that's got four legs and that's got four legs. It's got to be the same species. It's, you can't do that. It's much more complicated. So, yeah, so this... But there was also this bit, some sort of, like, a technology. So it was... So maybe it was a bit kind of archon. Because I say, I've got these... There was these funny rocks and they had, like, little sort of... Um, maybe they had wire legs that were moving on. And... Um, but it didn't have any eyes or anything on them. They didn't seem to have an issue with me. They had an issue with each other. They were, I guess, they would eat each other's young. That's what it was, potentially. If it wasn't guarded by the other female, I don't know why. And then there was this other robotic device that seemed to be um, sort of petting one of them. So it's very sort of unusual, you know, where, how far life could be. And, I mean, that's kind of the xenopolitics. But looking at the politics of this planet, we need to move, change gears here. If we engage with another life form, we've got the issues we've got is who's the, who's the biggest, who's got the biggest guns here? Who's the biggest threat? Instantly go into a war mode to deal with something. We don't need war anymore. It means we should be moving on from that. It's, it's a bit ridiculous. I mean, we've, we've, you basically, once you get to nukes, you, you realise that it's... Um, it's like playing noughts and crosses. I mean, sure, there's a pattern you, you can win, but most of the time, everyone loses. It just doesn't... You get to stalemate, or, you know, it's just... It becomes pointless. And they had that um, film um, with the um, war games, and that was pretty much what it is. You realised there was no winners from it, so it just seems like a waste of time. And I think that's why we need to realise, you know, how far we we, we basically... Industries created warfare. It's also created the situation for our, it's idealism as well. The idea that it's, there's things in this world that are good and evil, when actually there's behaviour that represents it, but nothing is. It's just um, a transient state. I mean, most things don't. I mean, if if they go into what the, a, a kind of evil, it's usually a destructive spiral, and they usually burn out. There's nothing left of them. In essence, the same for somebody who's kind of giving out all the time. He's just going to burn out as well. So everything's a balance of the two, the dark and the light, if they see it that way. <clears throat> but the idea that it's, that's the enemy, but then behind the scenes, the enemy does exactly the same as, as the other side does. You know, they, I remember seeing something to do with um, to do with a, like a war film, and the guy killed this soldier. But when he looked in his wallet, he could see he's got wife and kids and everything the same as him. So he stops seeing him as the enemy in that, that period of time, and it's difficult. So it's a mindset, the problem is. 
human mindsets. And then there's also things on TV that is feeding people such with toxic garbage. People's lives are reflecting soaps because they're spending 10 hours a week watching soaps of things where all people do is argue and fall out of each other constantly. And there's nothing ever works out. And people believe it. And I think it's generating a mental illness in society where you've got people that believe soaps are real and they go and attack characters or they, do, you know, love characters or all these other, they worship them. It's just a bit kind of bizarre. Anyway, this is um, Pigsy's video, so on this note, I will end it and hope you have a great day or whatever you're up to and, and a great Christmas if you're here. It's around Christmas time, now. Take care. Bye. <laughs>